You know, there are so many different messages we can glean from Pentecost with the Holy Spirit, the giving of the law, the first fruits, and Christ being the first fruit. We can go with so many different ways of approaching that. But today I want to start by going back to the first Pentecost to see what they did, and then we'll progress on to the New Testament. So if you would please turn with me back to Exodus chapter 19. We'll start with Israel at Mount Sinai. Exodus chapter 19. So I can get in my performance mode. (laughs) Exodus chapter 19, we'll start in verse 1. And it says, In the third month after the sons of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that very day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. And when they went out from Rephidim, they came into the wilderness of Sinai and camped into the wilderness. And there Israel camped in front of the mountain. And Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, And tell the sons of Israel, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. That's a clear example how God takes care of us and wants us to be brought back to him and close to him. And he wants to bless us. But there are conditions for God's blessings. And and going on in verse 5, Now, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you will be my own possessions among all the peoples of, of, uh, for the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nations. So keep in mind how valuable we are to God, not just because of us, but what he makes us. But... Remember that God wants the people to obey. And these are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. And in verse 7, So Moses came and called the elders of the people and set before them all the words which the Lord had commanded him. And the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do. Actually, they're making a covenant with him. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will come to you in a thick cloud, so that the people may hear when I speak with you, and may also believe in you forever. And then Moses told the words of the people to the Lord. Now, they were not allowed to see the Lord, but he is using a sign when he comes in a thick cloud and speaks to Moses. Now, this is very similar when Jesus was baptized and the Holy Spirit descended as a dove and the loud voice said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. The the dove that came down as the Holy Spirit was a sign to those people around that the Holy Spirit was coming down. Well, when the Lord came down on top of Mount Sinai in fire and smoke, it was a sign to those people that he was coming down on top of the mountain, not just to cover him up so he, that because he didn't want them to see him. It was also a sign that he was showing them that he was coming down. So remember, it's a sign of him coming down, not just a covering. It's a sign of that he is coming down. Remember that because we're going to talk about that sign coming down just like when Christ was baptized, when the Spirit came down and he came up from being baptized, the dove was a sign coming down. God's giving us signs. So going on in verse 10, the Lord said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow and let them wash their garments. Let them be ready for the third day, for on the third day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in sight of the people. And you shall set bounds for the people all around, saying, Beware that you do not go up on the mountain or touch the border of it, for whoever touches the mountain 
shall be put to death. Have you ever wondered why God did that? Isn't that strange that he said, I'm going to put a border all the way around the mountain? Well, you know, these borders are representative of the temple. The mountain was representative of the temple and of the holy of holies. You know, a regular Israelite could not enter it. He's telling them, I'm putting a border around the whole mountain. And the regular Israelites could not go up and touch the mountain. In fact, even a regular Levite could not go up and touch the mountain. In fact, he told them, if you did, you're going to die. Only the high priest could enter it. The Lord was not accessible to everyone at this time, is what he's telling them. Now, this is extremely important to realize that at this time. The Lord is coming down upon the mountain on Pentecost at this time, is what he's telling them. It's important to remember that God is telling them it is so serious that if you try to come up to me on Pentecost, you're going to die. And I'm telling, he's telling them, I'm putting borders around this. Even if an animal comes up to me, it's going to die at this time. And he tells Moses this several times and goes back down and tells them. He loves them so much. And he says, don't do this. We go on to verse 13. He says, no hand shall touch him, but he shall surely be stoned or shot through. Whether beast or man, he shall not live. When the ram's horn sounds a long blast, they shall come, shall, they shall come to the mountain. This is not the time when you're going to have access to the Lord. Even though there's all they can see, all of this coming down to the mountain, they still blast the ram's horn, telling them, this is the time you're not going to be able to come up and touch. We, we, we put out borders around the mountain, and you can only come so far, and you can't come any farther. Just like when you got up to the temple. They could go so far to the temple through certain gates, but you couldn't go in to the Holy of Holies. The certain, Levi, or certain priests could go so far, certain Levites could go so far, but when you got into the Holy of Holies, only the high priest could go there, and only once a year, you know, at Passover and all. But he's telling here on the Pentecost, you're not going to be able to go up on the mountain. In verse 14, so Moses went down from the mountain to the people and he consecrated the people and they washed their garments and he said to the people, be ready for the third day, do not go near a woman. And so it came about on the third day when it was the morning that there were thunder and lightning flashes and a thick cloud. Do you, do you think God's going to get their attention? You think when all this has happened that he got their attention on that. You know, yesterday I talked about being in awe of God. Do you think they're going to be in awe of God? Do you think God didn't do something on purpose that they're going to look up and be in awe of God at this time? I think he was, that he made sure. You know, there were flashes and a thick cloud upon the mountain. And then on top of all of that, he said a very loud trumpet sound. Now, you and I might have an idea of what a very loud trumpet sound is. Even if we had one trumpet in here, he can make it so loud that we would all consider it very loud. And God might say there's a loud trumpet sound. But when God says it's a very loud trumpet... I kind of have an idea. His idea of very loud is more than my idea of very loud. And if you are on top of a mountain, loud, it's hard to make a trumpet loud. But when God says it's very loud, that's something different. And it goes on and it says, so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. 
So his idea of a very loud trumpet is something that is beyond us to say that there was a trumpet that was very, very loud. Now, if you want to turn to Deut Deuteronomy 32, you can. It's just one verse. But I don't know if you remember when Moses was on his deathbed. Moses told us a little bit more about this. Moses knew an awful lot more that he doesn't tell us in Exodus. And wouldn't it be wonderful if we could sit and talk to Moses what this was like when he went up on the mountain and spoke to the Lord? He knows he was there, and he knew an awful lot more, and he saw an awful lot more that happened that he didn't tell us at this time. But he does tell us just a little bit in Deuteronomy 32. When he was about to die, he told his family a little tidbit about this. In Deuteronomy, or excuse me, Deuteronomy 33, verse 2, he said, The Lord came from Sinai and dawned on them from Seir. He shone forth from Mount Paran, and he came from the midst of 10,000 holy ones. At his right hand, there was flashing lightning for them. You know, can you imagine that? Where'd the lightning come from? God didn't even cause it to come from the sky. It came from his hand. You know, he wanted these flashings of lightning to come from out that. He held out his hand, and the lightning came from his hand, held out his hand, and all the lightning could come from his hand. He just, you know, Moses just told us just a little bit about this. You know, and remember, this was exactly 50 days after they sacrificed the Passover lamb. The fire, the lightning, the smoke, the trumpet, and the quaking was the sign for the Israelites. Again, this is a sign that something was happening and something that they should remember. Let's go on back to Exodus 19. And we'll go on with verse 17. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. And Mount Sinai was all in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. And I want you to remember about the fire because we're going to come back. As you can imagine, we're going to talk about fire when we get back into Acts because fire's going to have a large part of what we're going to talk about. And its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked violently. Now, we've talked about earthquakes. You've heard about earthquakes and all. Can you imagine? You know, an earthquake talks about an area in the land. Can you imagine the entire mountain quaking, not just the area of the land? You know, can you may I mean, I have a hard time imagining that, an entire mountain mountain quaking in verse 19 when the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder was this an angel or an archangel i don't know he doesn't tell us was some great angel angelic being standing there blowing that moses spoke and god answered him with thunder it scared the people now god could have just spoke to moses he could have just said something to him he answered with the voice of thunder out here. Do you see what, what Jesus is doing when he answers back this way? In verse 20, the Lord came down on Mount Sinai. You know, Mount Sinai was the highest mountain in this whole area. The tallest mountain in the whole area. Now, with all of this going on, with the entire mountain quaking, smoke, lightning, fire coming down. Do you realize that all of the other nations in the entire area would have seen this? All of the other countries in this whole area would have seen this happening. They could have looked up and seen this. The other people had to have known this was going on and wondering what was happening. And I'm sure God did this for a reason. He wanted the other people to see this happening on that. 
So verse 20, the Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain and Moses went up. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, go down and warn the people that they do not break through to the Lord to gaze and many of them perish. One more time, God was care, cared about the other people. He warned them because he didn't want them to die. One more time, he was telling them, this is not the time that you can approach me. Not the time that you can come up to me. I am not open to you at this point in time. And he cared so much about them, he didn't want any of them to die at this point in time. Not even the animals. He put barriers against all of them. He didn't want them up on the mountains. And in verse 22, also, don't let the priest who come near to the Lord, and, and let, also let the priest who come near to the Lord consecrate themselves, or the Lord will break out against them. And so Moses said to the Lord, the people cannot come up to the mountain, for you are warned, saying, let the bounds about the mountains and consecrate it. And so, then the Lord said to him, go down and come up again with you and Aaron with you, but don't let the priest and the people break through to come up to the Lord or he will break forth upon them. No one else is allowed to ex uh, access to them on this first Pentecost day. And so Moses went down to the people in verse 25 and told them. And then in chapter 20, God gave them the Ten Commandments. And I want you to look in, in Exodus 20 in verse 18. And all the people perceived the thunder, the lightning flashes, the sound of the trumpet, the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood at a distance. And Moses said to them, uh, and then they said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will... Listen, but don't let God speak to us or we'll die. And Moses said to the people, don't be afraid for God has come in. Why? Why did God come into them? He said, in order to test you, in order that the fear of him may remain with you so that you may not sin. He didn't come at this point in time to give them the Holy Spirit. He didn't come at this time to give access to them. He gave them two reasons, to test you and to give them the fear that they may not sin. That's why he was there at that time. Now let's jump over to Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2 in verse 1, it says, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, just like the Israelites were in chapter 18. We all know this is exactly 50 days after Jesus was crucified, just like the 50 days after the Passover lamb was killed. And suddenly there was from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Here we have a loud noise, just like the thundering noise when the Lord came down on Mount Sinai. And in verse 3, there appeared to them tongues of fire distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. So we see fire in the Old Testament. We see fire a large, in a large part in the New Testament the same way. Now remember, Jesus came down in an amazing display of fire on Mount Sinai. But here we see fire coming down, but in a different way. Would you look back with me in Matthew chapter 3, verse 11? Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. This is the baptism of Jesus. And John the Baptist says, For as for me, I baptize you with water for repentance. But he, and this is speaking of Jesus, for he who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with 
the Holy Spirit, and fire. And most of the commentaries believe that this is referring to Acts Acts chapter 2 for what I just read about being baptized with fire. And it's also repeated in Acts 11.16. And then if you keep reading in Matthew, we go on to the baptism of Jesus. And then when he comes up out of the water, we go what I had just read about, when the sky opens up and the Spirit of God descends upon Jesus as the dove. And it, it, it's another significant sign for us. And then what happens right after the dove comes down and lights on Jesus, he begins his ministry of work. That's exactly when he begins his ministry. So what happens? He is baptized. He comes up out of the water. The Holy Spirit comes down upon him, and he begins his work. So do you see what happens? We have the fire, the ministry. The fire hits him. The ministry begins through them. The Spirit enters, enters him, and he begins his work. So let's go back to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 and verse 4. Acts chapter 2 and verse 4, and it says, And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. And do you see what happened to them? They were getting filled with the fire. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and it led to works. The same thing that happened to Jesus. He was filled with the Holy Spirit, and it began his work. The same thing happened to these people on the day of Pentecost. The Spirit entered them, and they began to speak with other tongues. They began their work. Now, it did not happen in the Old Testament. They did not receive the Spirit. There was no change in them, and they went on to commit idolatry almost immediately after them. Let's go on to verse 5. And there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred and the crowd came together, they were bewildered because each one of them were hearing them speak in their own language, and they were amazed and astonished, saying, Why aren't these all speaking Galileans? How is it that we each hear them in in our own language to which we were born? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt. I should have had Kevin reading all these names for me. Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the districts of Libya around Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them in our own tongues, and what were they doing? Speaking of the mighty deeds of God. They had a job to do. They went out speaking the mighty deeds of God. You see, that they weren't speaking gibberish or some unknown tongue. They were speaking languages of different people, but they were speaking something that was very important. They spoke the mighty deeds of God, and they were boldly speaking to these many different people. They, They were spreading the gospel. That's what they were doing. Now, why did God use tongues of fire? Isn't fire used to punish or scare or burn up the wicked people? Why did God use fire to come down on these people? Turn with me back to Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah is talking about he is at the throne of God. In Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 5, Isaiah 6 verse 5, he said, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, 
for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of lo- of hosts. Like I said, Isaiah is at the throne of God, and when Isaiah saw the Lord and the seraphim, he knew he was among the holy. He knew he was in trouble. People didn't see God and live. People had trouble even standing around messengers from God, and he knew he was a sinner, and he knew that something bad would probably happen to him. And in verse 6, one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs. And he touched my mouth with it and and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. You know, the seraph brought a live coal from the altar and touched his lips. And you have to realize he touched his lips not to hurt him, but to heal him. You know, he didn't cauterize it, but he cleansed him with with it. There were purifications by fire. You know, the spirit works as fire. The the seraphim put life back into the prophet to make him zealously work, you know, for them. You know, uh, the way to purge the lips from the, his uncleanliness of sin was to use the fire, you know, and put fire back into the, for him for the love of God. This live coal was taken from the altar, either the altar of incense or that of the burnt offerings, because they both were burning continually around the throne of God. And in the verse 8, he said, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Who shall I send and who will go with us? And then I said, Here I am, send me. That's what Neil sang about today in his special music. Now, what a change there was in Isaiah. He was scared to death just a few minutes ago. And the tongues of fire cleansed all those, you know, that were on Pentecost back there, you know, that we just, just read about. And what they do? They smoke they spoke of the mighty deeds of God to many of those different all those different nationalities. They went to work. Unfortunately, too many good-meaning Christians, you know, were, were stuck in a rut. You know, Charles, Charles Swindell, a big famous Christian writer, he tells about a bazaar that was held in a Christian or in a village in northern India. Everybody brought in their wares to trade and to sell. And there was this one old farmer who brought in a whole covey of quail. And he had a little string tied around the one leg of every single bird. And the other ends of all the strings were tied to a ring, which fit loosely over a central stick. And he taught the quail to walk in a circle, around and around and around the stick, like little mules at a sugar cane mill. And nobody seemed interested in buying any of the birds until a devout Brahmin came along. And he believed in the Hindu idea of respect for all life, so his heart went out to these poor little birds walking around in this little circle. And he walked up to the man and he said, I want to buy them all. Well, of course, the merchant was happy as could be. And so after receiving the money, the merchant was surprised to hear that the the Brahmin said, now, I want you to set them all free. And he said, well, what, what do you mean? And he said, you heard me. He said, cut the strings from them, let their legs and turn them loose. Well, the old farmer said, all right. He bent down and he took out a little knife and he snipped all the strings off of the quail. They were free at last. Well, you know what happened? The birds kept walking around and around and around the pole just like they had before. So finally, the man, the Brahmin, reached down and he shooed the quail away. Well, all the shoe flew up, went just a little bit of ways. They landed down in their little covey. They started walking around in their little circle, just like they had before. Even though they were free, they were unfettered, they were released, they went right back in their circle, just like they had done for so long. I'm afraid so many of us are just like those birds. We're good people. We believe in God. We accept all of the great doctrines of the church. But we've been marching around in circles like those little birds. We don't feel God's presence in our lives. How many of us have never heard the sound 
of the violent wind blowing. This church at Pentecost was a joyful, loving, dynamic group of individuals praising God when the Spirit came upon us. We, we need that kind of Spirit if we're going to be what God calls us. We can't see the Spirit, but we should be able to feel, feel it, and it should affect our lives. You know, we, we have a tendency in the church to minimize the role of the Holy Spirit. Now, listen, nobody's going to accuse us of being drunk because we have the Holy Spirit, like they did back in their days. We kind of recoil back at the thought of emotionalism. Nobody's going to call us the Holy Rollers when they see us in church. We don't want any violent wind to shake the foundations of our church. We're very content to be refined, and I'm pointing right at myself. We're very content to be respectable, responsible, and all above to be rational. And I'm pointing right at myself when I say that. And yet something's missing in our church today. It's not sincerity. We are all very sincere in our faith. It's not intellect. We have the best educated clergy and lay people in the world that the world has ever known. It's not financial uh, resources. Sometimes we might scramble, but we're pretty affluent in most of our churches. <clears throat> What's missing? What's missing in our churches? Could it be power? Could it be? When Jesus left our world, he promised that the Holy Spirit would, would come upon all who believed in him. The Holy Spirit might be working in one of you right now as I'm talking to do something. Here is what it offers, new life, new joy, new effectiveness in serving Jesus. When the sound like a rushing mighty wind came and the Spirit appeared like tongues of flame, as the message puts it, they were thunderstruck. When the Spirit came upon the disciples, it changed everything. Look what happened to them. From timid souls, they became vital, vigorous, and unstoppable champions of the new faith. Look, look what Peter did. He was timid. Look, he, look what happened when Christ was being crucified. He denied him three times that night. And then look what happened right after this on Pentecost. He got up and he preached a sermon. He was a powerhouse preacher. In that sermon, over 3,000 turned. And look what they said. What do we have to do to change our lives? And he said, repent and be baptized. And they did. Look how strong his words were. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he spoke. Look at the change in him that came about on that. They did and they were to the tune of 3,000 on that. That's the difference that the Holy Spirit made in him. I just want to read to you from the easy read version from Romans 5, 5. It says, and this hope, and that hope is sharing of God's glory will never disappoint us. We know this because God has poured out his love to fill our hearts through the Holy Spirit he gave us. Not that he will give us, that he gave us. That Jesus is the same today. So if you ask God for his Holy Spirit every day, what will he do for me and for you. Are we going to walk around in circles like those birds? Or will your life be changed? Because we can use that power to correct our life. We can use that power to help people inside and outside the church. To use our personal contact to give a helping hand for prayer. For using the internet. To use our phones to help people. How are we going to, to, to continue to change our lives and grow with the love and the power of God?
Remember the Lord said, Whom shall I send and who will go forth with us? Send me. Send me. Thank you all.